Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We have a very special workshop for you today by Giuseppe D'Angelo uh, called uh, Back to Basics, Writing a Model. Uh, just a moment. Let's see. We see some people coming in. All right. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Happy to have you here at QT Day. Okay, fantastic. So we're going to uh, do a workshop today, uh, Back to Basics, Writing a Model. And uh, let me go ahead and introduce you all to our workshop speaker today, Giuseppe. Uh, let me bring him live for this part. Here we go. Hi, Giuseppe, glad to have you here. Thank you, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So uh, before we get started, I'm just going to tell them all about you a little bit. Uh, so Giuseppe <laughs> here is an improver of the QT project and a software engineer at KDAB. He is a longtime contributor to Qt, having used Qt and C++ since 2000. Uh, his contributions in Qt range from containers and regular expressions to GUI, widgets, and OpenGL. Uh, a free software passionate and Unix specialist. Before joining uh, KDAB, Giuseppe organized conferences on open source around Italy. Uh, he holds a bachelor's in computer science. And uh, about our workshop today, uh, in 2020, let's, let's go back to basics, uh, writing model and view code. It's somehow uh, taken for granted. It's, uh, however, a mandatory skill for any proficient Qt developer. Uh, professionals are supposed to be able to write robust, fast, and tested models. And so we'll see how to do that together in this workshop. And uh, any non-trivial Qt application will feature usages of the model, uh, view, controller framework, and MVC is a well-known design pattern, embracing separation of concerns between managing the data and the user interface that is supposed to visualize and manipulate it. Uh, so what exactly is a model in Qt's MVC design? Uh, how do we write one? What is the developer's responsibility? And what instead is provided by Qt, maybe as convenience? Uh, what are the performance characteristics of the models and how do we test one? So the answers are not so trivial and it's important to nail them down to write robust model code that will drive the rest of our user interface. So in this workshop, we'll write together some models, use them in combination with some other views, and while doing so, show all the best practices associated with such development. All right, so uh, I hope you all enjoy. We'll have a, so a short video and then get started. So talk to you soon. Okay, here we are. Um, let me just get started and uh, share the presentation slides. Okay, that's very good. Uh, fantastic. All right. Uh, so, what's more, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction to the to myself and to the workshop. Uh, this was actually the subject of the first couple of slides I had here. Uh, regarding well, presenting myself. Uh, I'm kind of an old timer here at Cute Day. Uh, so I'm, I work for KDAB and uh, I write a lot of code related to Cute. So I decided this year uh, not to talk about something new, something bleeding edge, something that is coming with Cute 6. Uh, I decided to uh, slightly go back a little bit and decide to uh, focus on something that I find uh, foundational. And the thing I found foundational this year was uh, writing a model view code. Uh, why is that? Why is that important to me? Why is it kind of code got this special place in my heart? Uh, well, because I think that uh, as 
someone who uses Qt every day, uh, it's extremely important to understand what are the basic foundations of Qt programming. Because the basic stuff, uh, it's used literally everywhere, uh, even more than you know the bleeding edge stuff. Maybe you don't, you're not running Qt 6, maybe you're not even running Qt 515. Uh, so uh, there is something about, uh, let's focus on something which is there, which has been there for a very long time. And I don't believe uh, it should be uh, ignored. I believe that this stuff needs to be discussed more and taught more and uh, even improved. And although I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about today is model view programming, and model view programming is a very old thing in Qt, uh, it does not mean that being old uh, is somehow uh, perfect and uh, there's nothing to improve there. There's nothing to not learn. No, there is a lot of, to learn regarding the basics. There are still some rough edges around Qt and there is still some evolution happening. Even in Qt 6, we're adding new stuff into model view programming. Uh, so what specifically I decided to talk about the model view is because uh, model view is uh, a central framework inside of Qt. Something that I always say when I give these kind of trainings and I give these kind of workshops is that uh, any non-trivial Qt application will use some model view. And some application actually uses model view extensively. Okay, uh, in any application you're going to write using Qt, there is going to be something which is uh, a list of things or a table of things or a tree of things. And uh, these will be data-driven. So you may have, uh, whatever, a list of Wi-Fi networks somewhere, right? That you gather somehow, and then you need to show it in your UI. So uh, if you're a developer and using Qt, uh, maybe uh, you may not uh, end up writing view code. Maybe you will have designers handling the presentation part of this data. But as a developer, you will write models. You will write lots of models. Uh, so it's, I believe, important to master this. This should be like a, uh, not an acquired skill anymore. You should become part of your daily life using Qt. You should not be afraid of writing one extra model if you need that. So what are we going to see today? I've prepared a little agenda. Uh, so the first part of this workshop, we are going to introduce a little bit of theory. So what is about, all about model view programming in Qt? I will start really, really from the foundational parts. I will start with the definitions and the basic concepts. Uh, what is a model in Qt? That is a good question. We need to answer that question. Uh, what is a view? Uh, what are the responsibilities of the model? What are the responsibilities of the view? Uh, and then we will focus exclusively on the model part of things. So uh, what is the structure of a model in Qt? What kind of data can be represented for, uh, by a model? And how do we access this data here into a model? Uh, this will uh, naturally uh, go into discussing the base class of all models, which is this class called QAbstract Item Model. We will have an overview over, over its uh, API. And then we will switch into kind of a hands-on part. So uh, I will do some live coding. Yes, I will risk uh, my career on this. And we will actually together create a list model, uh, which is the simplest model that we can create. Uh, but that will actually uh, make us learn a lot about model design. Because lots of things that we're going to see in there actually apply also to other kind of models. So we will spend quite some time uh, creating one, refining one, trying to understand what are all the implications of its API. And uh, in its first iteration, we were going to just create one which is like read-only. Uh, and then we will change it to one which is actually uh, modifiable somehow. So we will see how we can handle modifications of the model data. And then time permitting, we can see how this can evolve into something more complex. So stuff like a table model or a tree model or other uh, uh, other more complicated model concepts. Okay, so I've got some slides at the end, time permitting. So without further ado, let's get cracking and let's start discussing uh, the very basic steps about model view programming uh, in Qt. Okay, so uh, what, uh, well, 
Uh, what are our goals for now? Our goals for now is if you want definitions. We want to understand, uh, yeah, I'm, I've used the word model a lot, but what is a model exactly? What is a view exactly? Uh, if you uh, ever encountered model view APIs in Qt, you may also wonder what is a delegate? And if you have used model view in other frameworks than Qt, sometimes this pattern is not called model view delegate, it's called the model view controller. So, so uh, what is the controller thing, right? What is that and uh, how do I use it? So let's start by defining what a model is and what it does, okay? A model in Qt is better thought as uh, a class which uh, functions as an adapter class. An adapter uh, between two words, between two uh, sides. On one side, the job of your model is to access some data. So you have some data somewhere. I'm going to discuss in more detail what it is the, this data about, but you have some data yet you want to access. And the job of the model is to access this data. And that's one side of things. On the other side, the model exposes this data using a standard unified API, which is the API of this class in Qt called QAbstract Data Model. Okay. So uh, it really functions as if you want an adapter, something that takes data, which is customized, can have different shapes, different forms, and exposes it in a unified way, okay? Uh, what's the idea of having such an adapter? The idea is that uh, once I have a model, once I have such an adapter, then the upper layers, typically the views, can simply target the Q abstract item model API. And therefore they can, they can completely ignore the underlying details about how the data is actually accessed because these details are completely encapsulated by your model. So if I have to represent this graphically, I would probably use something like this, okay? So you have your data on the bottom, that's your data, you only know how to access it. Uh, on the middle, we have a model, which is a QAbstract Title Model subclass, something that we are going to write in a short while. And on the top, you have something that uses this model somehow, okay? So you may have, for instance, uh, if you're writing a widgets application, you may have a widget view that shows the data in the model. If you're using Qt Quick, you may have a Qt Quick view that shows the data in the model. Uh, but perhaps you may also not have a view directly. You may have some other C++ component that gathers the data through your model. So you may have some piece of logic that uh, analyzes the data, that filters the data, that does something with it, okay? And uh, it knows how to do that because it simply uh, uses your model as a QAbstract data model. So it implements the API uh, that is required, okay? So this is what a model is. And I believe it's extremely helpful to think of its responsibility like this. Okay, as this intermediate layer between the actual data and, uh, generally speaking, the views. What is a view? So I've just mentioned them. Let's define them. Uh, a view is a graphical component of some sorts that uh, displays the contents of a model. Okay, so it's a widget if we're using uh, Qt widgets, or it's uh, an element, a component if we're using Qt Quick. Uh, and the job of a view is to display the contents of a model. So uh, when we use Qt, Qt actually ships with many built-in views uh, in widgets and Qt Quick that we can just grab and use uh, because they, they just work. Uh, I have a couple of slides here just to give you an overview of what kind of views uh, you get out of the box when you use Qt. So if you're using widgets, because maybe you're writing a desktop application, uh, the views that you're likely going to use are uh, one of these three. We have a so-called queue list view, which is a widget that simply, that simply shows a list of elements, like here on the right. Uh, we may have a tree view, a queue tree view to say it all, which is the one in the middle. And as you can see, this actually shows a tree-like structure. Uh, and also has several, several columns, okay? So this now looks like a file manager of some sort. And then we have a queue table view. And a queue table view is a table which looks like a spreadsheet if you want. This look, 
it's the one on the bottom looks like a little bit like Excel or something like that. Uh, there is also some other, but they are really seldomly used, so I'm not even going to mention them. Uh, these three are by far the most common ones. If you said you're using Qt Quick, uh, you also have views in there. So if you're using Qt Quick, you may have something like a list view, the one on top that simply arranges the elements in a list. You may have a grid view, the one in the middle, arranges the elements in a grid. Uh, you may have a path view, which arranges elements across a path, like this one on the bottom. You may also decide to use a repeater, which is a special uh, Qt Quick uh, component that uh, gets a model and simply creates a number of objects out of that model. And typically, th this gets combined with something to uh, position the elements, something like a row or a column. Those are elements in Qt Quick that allow you to uh, lay out the objects created by the repeater. Okay, So a view is just this. It's something that it gets used to visualize the contents of a model. We create one of these, and we, we show it, and that's it. Today. We're good to go. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, in Qt Quick, uh, I believe uh, in 5.14 or something like that, uh, 5.12, uh, we also have uh, a table view now. And on the Qt Marketplace, there is now also a tree view element. Okay, so this shows like a table, and this shows like a tree. Yep. So mm, there is something important to say about views, uh, in Qt at least. Uh, the idea about a view in Qt is that the views read the data from the model, but they don't actually display the data uh, themselves. They don't display the data directly. Uh, the view, uh, the main purpose of a view is actually to uh, lay out other objects that we're going to call delegates. And these other objects are laid out, of course, according to the kind of view we're using. So if you're using a, a list view, then we lay the delegates one below each other, right, vertically. If we're using a table view, then we actually have a two-dimensional grid of delegates. And what is the point of this other object? Well, the point of a delegate is actually uh, having an object whose responsibility is to draw, to edit, and to interact with one single piece of data, OK? Uh, so if to represent this graphically and to understand the, the responsi different responsibilities between a delegate and a view, uh, suppose I have this list view here represented in the middle. Okay, So a list view as a whole has an overall idea of a view over the model. So what it needs to do is to, for instance, provide scrolling, provide an idea of having selection or a current item. OK, uh, but a list view itself does not actually draw any of these lines. The lines themselves are drawn by something else, something that we're going to call a delegate. And the responsibility of a list view is simply to lay out these delegates, since it's a list view, vertically. OK, and then it tells the delegate, draw the first element, draw the second element, draw the third element in this position. That's what a list view does. Uh, there are some minor differences between how this works in uh, QWidgets and in Qt Quick, but the theory is pretty much the same. So regarding views and delegates, uh, there is something to say here. When we use Qt model view, uh, we typically don't create views in the sense that we don't create our own customized view. We just use the ones that come with by Qt, right? So if, uh, if Qt provides uh, a list view, we're just going to use a list view element. We create one, and we go with it. But we don't create a brand new view, a, a new view class, that, that should I say. Uh, the reason is that uh, typically we don't need any of that, OK? Uh, however, sometimes we may need to customize the look and feel of the elements inside uh, a view. And for doing that, sometimes we're going to create a custom delegate and set it on the view. Uh, when do we do that? When do we create custom delegates? This depends. So if we're using Qt widgets, uh, there are actually built-in delegates that just work. 
Okay, I can create something like a queue list view, as I'm going to do in a second. And I just show it, and the queue list view actually shows something on the screen. In Qt Quick, we are not so lucky in the sense that if I'm using Qt Quick and I create something like a list view, a list view in Qt Quick does not have a built in delegate, and we must write one ourselves. So we must write some code which is responsible for dealing with the drawing and interaction with each line inside a list view. Okay. Uh, Qt Quick Controls True has some delegates that we may decide to just use, but those are like not in Qt Quick, they are in this controls library. Uh, by all means, use them as starting points if you want, uh, but then Qt Quick sometimes requires us to actually write our own delegates. Okay. Uh, but this is not the focus of today. The focus of today is writing models, not delegates. Okay. And what about the controller? So if you're coming from another framework, you may wonder, where is the controller? Well, there isn't uh, a controller uh, as traditionally, uh, as is intended traditionally uh, in the Qt model view framework. Uh, the traditional responsibilities of a controller are a bit split between the view and the delegate itself. Uh, but that's fine. It's just a matter of terminology. It's just a matter of understanding uh, who does what in Qt. Okay? And this diagram on the right should make it clear about who does what. Okay? So to summarize this little bit of theory, uh, we have three things. We have M1 models. Models are just adapters for the data. Number two, we have views, okay? And the point of a view is to display a model. And number three, we have delegates, okay? Delegates are objects which are sometimes created, created, destroyed, but especially laid out by views. And the purpose of a delegate is to draw one single unit of data and to manage the interaction with that unit of data. Okay, that should be fine. So let me actually show some of this in action if I manage to share my screen and uh, voila and switch back to uh switch back to Qt creator so we can actually see a little bit of this theory uh practically uh, done in practice so what i have here is a little a little application that creates a model right here on line 34 i'm creating this simple model called the Qt string list model and uh, i'm populating it with some color names, and then I'm creating two different views to showcase that model. The first view is created right here, line 37, in which I'm creating a queue list view. So that's a queue widget view. I'm placing, um, setting this model on it, and I'm showing it. Okay, these are these three lines. Uh, I'm also using the same identical model in Qt Quick. So in order to uh, use this model in Qt Quick, I'm doing something else, which is, first and foremost, I'm exposing my model using uh, in Qt Quick. So uh, this is not a Qt Quick course, but uh, if you want to know more, please Google this when you have some time. Uh, this is a way to expose my list model object in QML. And then down here, I'm going to actually load some QML and show it. So what is inside this main QML? Well, let's find out. So inside that main QML, I have now a Qt Quick list view. Okay, that's a list view. So it's a Qt Quick component. Its model is going to be my model coming from C++. So it's the same list of strings. And in Qt Quick, I also have to specify this object called a delegate, uh, which is responsible for drawing each line inside my list view. So let's say that I want each line to be uh, like a rectangle uh, whose color is alternating. And inside that rectangle, I got something else. I got some text, I got some other elements. This is all I need to write manually or sometimes my designer writes this for me because I'm not that good at actually writing UIs. Uh, but this is required for list view to actually show something on the screen because list view in Qt Quick does not come with a built-in delegate. If I run this, I end up with these two views showing the same model. So on the left, I have my list widget, queue list, 
So it's a queue list view. Uh, it's a widget coming. And on the right, I got a list view in QML. Okay. You can see this QML. It's got all this fancy kinetic scrolling and whatnot. Okay. Uh, and I had to specify exactly how to draw each and every line. But the contents of these two views are actually the same. They both feed from the same model. So as you can see, the, there are the same names in both lists. OK. All right. Back to the slides. Here we go. So that's a little bit of theory about model writing. Now let's go more in detail uh, and focus on what is a model exactly and how does it look like? What is the structure of a model? OK. So I'll go back to this slide and let's remind ourselves once more what is the responsibility of a model. Okay, the responsibility of a model is to access the data and uh, you know the data, you know what the data looks like, okay? Uh, and expose this data to views and to other consumers, to anything you want using the QAbstract item model public API. That's the responsibility of the model. So what do I mean by data? I keep using this word. What is data, data, data? Okay, so the data itself can really be anything you want or almost anything you want. Uh, the data is something which is specific to your application and it can be something that you use in your business logic. Okay, so it could be something like an in-memory data structure, like a vector of objects that you want to represent in some view maybe a tree of objects, a tree of nodes, who knows? Uh, it could be not in memory, maybe it's on disk, the contents of some file that you have and you want to represent it into a view. Maybe it's not even in a file, maybe it's like metadata, for instance, the file system structure below a given directory. So you got like a root directory, and inside that directory you have files and you have subdirectories, which also have files inside. Okay, this is kind of metadata of the file system. It may not even be local. Maybe you want to represent uh, the contents of a table in a SQL database elsewhere, or maybe the results of some SQL query. That's fine. You can represent this inside uh, a cute model view. Uh, maybe the result of a REST call to some cloud service. Okay, uh, this doesn't matter uh, for us. Oh, this doesn't matter for Qt. Why does it not matter for Qt? Because as the author of your models, uh, you know how to actually access the data. You know what kind of library you have to use. You know what kind of SQL queries you have to run in order to access the data. That's the responsibility of your model. And that's what you need to do. So inside your model, you're supposed to write uh, any sort of glue code, which is required to access your data present it to the views using the QAbstract Atom model API. Now, I said almost anything. Why almost anything? Well, because uh, typically in a user interface, we don't actually have like arbitrary data visualized. Uh, Qt models are able to uh, show and to describe uh, these kind of data structures and only these kind of data structures. That is, Qt models are able to describe things like lists of elements. So if you want one dimensionals, things that just have rows, uh, they are able to represent tables of data. So two dimensionals, you have rows and you have columns, and also trees of elements. So you have rows, you have columns, but also it, at each level you may have for the children down. All right, uh, Qt models can describe these. Uh, because these are the ones that you actually have typically in your user interface. Uh, some other fancy data structure, like, I don't know, a graph or something like that, sorry, that, that's not so common. You don't uh, represent it using the abstract data model. You need something else. Okay. Now, let's look at this picture on the right. Right, so you see the tree, and that looks like a tree. Yes, it's got a root, it's got some rows, the first row also has children and whatnot. But let's move a little bit to the left. Let's look at the table. Uh, so the table, yes, it's a rows, it's got columns, but it's also got this strange root item over there, which does not really belong to a table, does it? 
and also a list. I mean, yeah, I got individual rows, and also the list that's got it's got this root item. What's the deal with that? Well, the deal with that is pretty simple. Uh, for Qt, lists and tables are actually uh, special cases of trees. So they are just trees uh, without children, without further children. So a table is just a tree without children, it's just the first layer. And the list is actually a table with one column, just the first column. Okay, these are considered, if you want, uh, special cases of the more the most general case, which is the tree model. Uh, why does this matter? Uh, why do we care? Uh, that's because this kind of a structure is present in the QAbstract item model APIs. So when we use the QAbstract item model APIs, we will see that everything works thinking of trees, even if we don't have a tree, even if we just have a list. We are, we are constantly reminded that uh, things are derived from this more generic data structure, which is the tree, even if we are in a simpler case. Okay, so let's let's start dealing, let's start delving a little bit more in depth about uh, how do we uh, access the data inside a model. Okay, I got a model, it may be a list, maybe a tree, maybe a table. How do we actually navigate into it? Uh, so the first class that we need to discuss in order to understand that is a helper class that uh, we use in order to navigate our model. This helper class is called a Q model index. Okay, and what is a Q model index? A Q model index is, if you want, a pointer, double quote pointer, uh, pointing into to a specific position inside a model, pointing to a specific cell into a model. So what we can do in order to access the data, what, what we must do in order to access the data is first and foremost, obtaining a model index pointing to a specific uh, piece of data, to a specific row, to a specific column. Okay, that will be the first step. And then given a model index, we will actually be able to access the data. So how do I actually do that? How do I get a model index from, uh, from a model? Well, it works like this, okay? And uh, it's, again, less obvious than it needs to be because everything is done in terms of trees. But the first thing that we can do is obtaining a model index pointing to that root item that every model has, even non-trees. I keep insisting on this, okay? So if I have this table model here on the right, okay? The first thing I may want to do is to get a model index pointing to the root item of the table model. And getting a model index pointing to there is extremely simple. All I need to do is default construct a model index. So if I write Q model index parenthesis, okay, what I get is a model index that represents the root item of the model. Okay, this root item over here is obtained by simply creating a default constructed model index. Now, I wish that when once you do that, I wish that once you write Q model index, uh, that model index is called a root model index or something like that. Uh, that is not the case, unfortunately. For some reason, like lost in history, the model index that represents the root item, it is simply classified as the non-valid or invalid model index, okay? And in fact, if I have a model index and I want to know if that model index is pointing to the root or it's pointing somewhere else, the call that I have to do to distinguish these two cases is called is valid. Okay. Uh, the usual joke at this point is that if I had a time machine, I could go back when this thing was designed. I probably would not name this as is valid. I would probably call this like is root or something like that. Uh, but that's what we have. So it's valid, consider these in your mental model, that if you have a valid model index, it means it's pointing somewhere in the contents. If you have a non-valid model index, then it's pointing at the root. That's the mental model that we should have, okay? So default constructed model index points at the root. Fair enough. How do I get into the table now? 
So the way I get a model index pointing somewhere into the table is by using the index method on the model. Each model has to provide this index method, okay, which returns a Q model index pointing to a specific position. Now, this index call takes three parameters. It takes the row that you're interested in, the column that you want, and also, of course, the parent index. Okay, so the index of the parent uh, element relative to the one that you're asking for. So suppose we want to ask about A. I want the model index to point to A. How do I get that? Well, A is at row zero, column zero, and what is its parent? Its parent index is the root. So its parent index is the invalid model index, the non-valid model index. Okay, so a way to ask for an index of A is getting my model and asking for index, row zero, column zero, below the root. Okay, remember what this means. The invalid model index means the root. To get an index for B, this is now row one, column one, again below the root. So one, one, cumulative index, open and close parentheses. And C, C is row two, column one, below the root. Row two, column one, below the root. Yep. So this is what I meant when I said that the fact that even a table is a tree appears in the API. You have this third parameter around, which does not make any sense in case of tables, but it's still there, right? And you need to know that it's there and what it means. Uh, let's actually make it to good use. Let's see another example of getting an index pointing to somewhere, but this time uh, if we have a tree. So if I, have a, if I actually have a tree model, uh, now this parent parameter becomes actually meaningful. So suppose I want to get the index for B, okay? How do I get the index for B, which is down here? The, in order to get the index for B, I need to ask for row one, column zero, below A. But wait a minute, I don't have the index for A. Right, you need to go one step further. So first you need to ask for the, for the index of A. What is A? A is row zero, column zero, below the root. Okay, I can do that. That's the first line. The index of A is index zero, zero, below the root. And once I have the index of A, I can actually for the I actually, actually ask for the index of, index of B. So what I do is that ask for the row one, column zero, below A. Okay, so the third parameter now, the parent index can be meaningful. It's not always the default constructed one. In trees, it's different, okay? So now I know how to build one. Uh, let me discuss briefly the API of a model index. So if I gave a Q model index with an index, you can actually ask a few questions about it because a model index has somehow a little bit of awareness regarding its position in the model. Given an index, you can ask it, what is your row? What is your column? Uh, what is the parent index that, uh, uh, so if you, are, if you are a valid index, what is your parent? This might be the root, this may be something else. Uh, are you the root? Okay. Is valid, think of, think of it this way. Think of it, it's a query for asking, are you the root index or not? Okay. If you're valid, you're not the root. If you are not valid, you are the root. And what is your model? Where do you come from? I mean, what model created you? You can ask all these questions to a model index, okay? Now, uh, there's one important thing that deserves one slide regarding a model indexes. So uh, now we know how to get them. Uh, but there is one important note, which is this. Uh, given a model index, a model index as an object is meant to be created using the index call that we have just seen, use it to access a model, okay? And then immediately discard it. Uh, you're not supposed to store uh, model indexes. Uh, the reason is that, remember I used the word, there are pointers that will quote into a model. Well, yes, uh, just like pointers, they may become dangling. They may become uh, pointing to illegal data. Uh, so you're not supposed to keep them around for longer than strictly necessary. 
Sometimes you may have the need to actually keep some of these for longer. And for if you need something like that, then please do not use a Q model index. Use another class, which is very similar. It's called a Q persistent model index. Uh, the difference between the two is that a Q persistent model index does not become dangling like a Q model index might. And of course, there is a trade off in the other direction. Using a Q persistent model index is much more expensive than using a plain Q model index. So you shouldn't just use persistent indexes just because. You should know when to use them. Uh, to give you an idea of a possible use case, a Q persistent model index is used, for instance, if you need to track. Uh, which one is the selected item into a model, okay? So you have a model and you want to like to know that the fifth element is the selected one and you need to keep track of that somewhere. Um, what happens if the model is modified later and maybe you remove the first row? Then, of course, the fifth element becomes now the fourth, but it's the same element. And you need to remember that it's the same element that is simply moved, okay? So the point of a Cooper system model index is that it will follow the element as it moves through the model because the model has been changed. A Q model index will not follow it and you will likely crash or access the, road, the wrong data, all sorts of bad things, okay? Now, let's use a model index to actually access data. How do we do that? Uh, there is one extra thing to know before we can actually jump and access data. That is, each cell inside a model can provide multiple data. Uh, model view in Qt, uh, a model in, view in Qt can provide, if you want, different uh, aspects of the data which is required to represent one single cell. So let's look at what I have right here. Okay, this is a list of elements if you want. But each element has multiple things that, it, that are shown. There is a string, which is shown here on the right. There is also a color next to it. Okay? And if you overlay your mouse cursor over it and wait for a tooltip to appear, there is also a tooltip that appears. And as you can see, it does not even contain the same data which is shown in the model. It contains some other data. Okay? So for each cell for each index in the model, uh, the model may provide different data. And uh, how do you distinguish these pieces of data? Uh, the, uh, the way we distinguish them is because each different piece of data has a so-called different role, okay? Uh, different roles are used to identify different, if you want, use cases for the, kind, for the data that I want, I'm requesting from your model. Uh, there are some roles that are provided by Qt. They have, like, if you want, built-in meanings, but you can always provide your own roles uh, in case you need something like that. So or to give you an idea, uh, if I have a model and ask to this particular cell for its so-called Qt display role, the model is supposed to return the string to display. So in this case, red as a string, okay, with uppercase R. If instead I ask for the decoration role, that's another piece of information. And typically the decoration role is supposed to return a color or a pix map or an icon, which then gets used to uh, draw the decoration next to my text. Okay. And there are many others. Uh, if you open the documentation for a cute item data role, uh, I might do it later. Uh, that documentation will tell you that Qt defines some like 15, 20, a uh, couple dozens of built-in roles with built-in semantics like this, okay? But the actual role is just an integer. You are free to define your own role with your own special meeting, meaning if you need to uh, return data from the model that has a special meaning to you, okay? And now we are ready. Now, I got an index, and I know which role I want to fetch data from. I can actually go to the model and request some data. And the way we request some data from the model is by calling the data function. So I have my model, I call data, and data takes two parameters. It takes an index and takes the role that I want the data from. Okay. I want to focus on this first line because this makes sense, right? But 
what is the return type of data? I mean, data has to return like a string. If I ask for a string, it has to return a color. If I ask for the decoration, so if I ask for the color there, how can the same function return multiple data types? Well, say hello to my little friend. Uh, in Qt, we have this so-called Q variant type, which is a generic container for, uh, for types. Okay, inside a Q variant, you can store any type that you want. You can store strings, you can store uh, icons, you can store uh, pix maps, you can store colors, and pretty much anything you want can be stored into a variant. So model data actually returns a variant. It does not return uh, something else, okay? So suppose that I want to ask for the text. Suppose that I want to ask for the display role of this cell right here. I got the index, and what I need to ask is model data, display role, and this returns a variant. So then I need to extract the string out of the variant, and the way I extract the string out of the variant is by calling toString on the variant. But through the same mechanism, you can return custom data types. Uh, Q variant is actually extensible. You can add support for your own data types inside Q variant. So it is legal for to ask your model, that index, and your specific role, and return some specific data here. Okay. Once you do that, uh, I mean, if you have specific roles, Typically, the built-in delegates don't know what to do with your role, but you can always write a delegate that also knows how to handle this in a special way. Okay, so to summarize this a little bit of theory so far, by using Qt classes, by using Qt model classes, such as QAbstract item model, okay, uh, we can describe lists, we can describe tables, we can describe trees, a Q model index is used to identify one element in the model, okay? And a non-valid Q model index is used to represent the root element, okay? And remember that even lists and tables have roots because they are seen as specialized cases of trees. Now, a model uh, is composed of cells, it's composed by different elements, and each element can provide multiple data under different roles. Yep, and we've seen why and how. So, uh, by the way, it's time for, if there are a few pending questions, by all means, um, uh, please ask them in the chat or in the Q&A uh, room. Uh, so feel free to interrupt me at any time. I will, from time to time, keep an eye on the chat and reply to anything that uh, uh, that is happening in there. I don't see much activity, so, I'll just probably continue a little bit, then we have a short break. Uh, let's see, an, uh, let's start with an overview over the API of a uh, abstract data model. So let's see what, what a model can do and what a model is supposed to do. Uh, the reason why I want to do with this overview and uh, this, uh, over the QAbstract atom model API is because then we are going to actually implement some of these functions in order to create our custom model. Okay, so uh, as a broad uh, as a broad API, what does QAbstract atom model need to do in regarding to the views regarding to the upper layers? Uh, QAbstract atom model needs to describe what is the structure of your model. And by that, I mean things like, how many rows do you have? How many columns do you have? Stuff like that. Uh, it needs to provide the contents of the model, as we have just seen through the data. And also, models are not necessarily static. Models may change over time, OK? So when a model changes, it must notify the views that something has changed, so that the views have a chance to update themselves. And therefore, the QAbstract Data Model API also has uh, change notifications okay, that we must implement. Uh, there is also something else about this, that is uh, views sometimes may want themselves to change data into a model. Maybe you want a model which is editable 
uh, from a view. So there is also a writing API, not just a reading API, uh, that allows a view to change the data contents or change a model structure. Maybe you want to rearrange rows or something like that. Okay. So let's have a, a quick glance, a quick overview about uh, the APIs of Kubernetes Architecture Model. Uh, the first thing, which is also the first thing that we're going to encounter, is um, there is a number of functions that we have to implement in order to describe our model structure to the views. So views may ask, how many rows are inside your model? And how many columns? And actually, how many rows do you have at each level? Because maybe you have a tree and the rows below the first child are not the same rows below the second child, right? So this query is slightly more complex than just asking how many rows do you have. Uh, but anyhow, you have these functions called like row count or column count or has children and so on uh, that views may use to query, to ask information about your model. You also have the index and the parent calls, calls that allow a view to get an index to a specific element. So a view asks you, how many rows have you got? Five. OK, give me the index for row number three. Here's the index. OK, this is part of, of the scheme uh, between describing a model to the view. Then, of course, a view can ask, what is the data at one specific index? OK, because I want to draw it, so I need to ask for the data. And we have seen the call that uh, uh, data that views use uh, to ask for the data is actually called literally data. In Git 6, this is also augmented by another function called multidata, which allows a view to ask for uh, multiple data in one go, for multiple roles in one go. Uh, there is also something extra. For instance, some views display headers on the top or on the side. So this information is also provided by the model to the views. And uh, Almost finally, there is also something else related to notifying views regarding changes into the model. So if something changes into the model, the model has to tell the view, hey, this is happening. Please update yourself. And models have like 20 or something like that different signals to, to do this notification mechanism. So they can tell the view hey, look, some data has changed inside my model. Or, hey, look, some rows have been inserted inside my model. You need to refresh yourself. You need to update the scrolling position, right? There's plenty, plenty of these uh, signals, and we're going to see how to use them. Also, views may want to modify the data inside your model. So, <coughs> excuse me. So optionally, you also have to implement functions like set data or set header data if you want a view to change the data inside your model. And uh, finally, you may also want to let a view modify the structure of your model, for instance, by moving a row for some for somewhere to somewhere else. Okay. What is the moral lesson of all of this? Why did I list all of this? Well, uh, because the actual overall API of Kubestruct Data Model is huge. If you look at the documentation and you look how many virtual functions are inside Kubestruct Data Model, there is plenty of them, dozens of them. Okay. Now, this don't get scared about this. Okay. Uh, most of those are not pure virtuals, okay? Most of those are not abstract. Most of those have a default implementation that does nothing at all, okay? You're not required to implement them. So most of this API is actually optional. Maybe your model does not need to be modified by view. Ignore the setters. Don't bother with them. And there is even something extra on top of this. That is, uh, there are convenience subclasses of Club Abstract Data Model for some common tasks, right? And we are supposed to use them because they will simplify our implementation. For instance, if you're implementing a list or if you're implementing a table, as we are going to do, uh, we are going to use these convenience subclasses that implement something for us. And inside Qt, there are actually concrete classes 
that sometimes are useful if I just need a model somewhere and I don't want to implement it myself. I just want to use one coming from Qt. So uh, just a quick word about these, uh, about these helper classes, about these convenience classes. Uh, if we are implementing a, <coughs> sorry, a list model or a table model, we are supposed to use the convenience. We are supposed to use QAbstract list model and QAbstract table model. Right? These two are subclasses of QAbstract item model. Okay, and they simply have already some implementation of some methods uh, for handling lists and handling tables. Okay? So most of the mandatory part is still implemented. There are just a couple of virtuals that we need to implement in these two. And of course, we can still implement all the optional parts. So stuff like support for modifications. If I need a modifiable list model, I'm going to subclass QAbstract list model and implement just the reminder of the methods to handle notifications. And uh, to quickly see also uh, some, to say something about concrete models, so concrete model classes. In Qt, uh, there is some classes that we may just decide to use as is, stuff like a QString list model. This is a ready-made model that simply exposes a list of strings. Now, is this really useful? Uh, maybe for prototyping? Yes, it's really useful. I need, I have got some view. I want to put some contents in there. I don't have the model, the actual model yet. Let's just populate it with a string list model. Uh, maybe uh, a generalization of this is a, something called a Q standard item model. Uh, now, this is a complete misnomer because there is nothing standard about it. You're not required to use it at all. This standard, forget about it. It's, uh, it's really, I don't know why, why it's called like that. A Q standard item model is simply a model, which can be a list, it can be a table, it can be a tree. And it's a model that you build uh, in program code. You create one of these objects, and then you say, OK, please add 10 rows to yourself. And it will add 10 rows. Okay, And then you say, set the data of the first row to this. And it sets the, the data of the first row to whatever you want. OK, uh, so this is also useful for prototyping or something like that. But there are actually good models, models that are useful, something like Q file system model. This is a model that represents uh, the file system structure. OK, so if you have to just visualize some folder uh, structure, then don't create the model yourself. That's extremely tricky. Just use Q file system model. In the Qt SQL module, there is also something called a Q SQL query model and also Q SQL table model. Uh, this can be used to represent the result of a SQL query, OK? And there's even many more available elsewhere. So in uh, our KDAB, KD toolbox library on uh, GitHub, or in KDE, in K8 mo item models, uh, you've got ready-made models to show data. So you don't need to implement a model yourself, OK? So we're almost one hour in. I would say, uh, are there are any questions? Let me check. Not yet. Uh, shall we take just five minutes break so I can get some water to drink? And we will be right back and we actually turn this into hands on. This is a workshop. So I'm going to create a, a list model uh, live and see uh, what does it involve. Sounds good. All right, everyone. As you heard him, we'll have a five minute break. So it's 59 now, and we'll see you at four past the hour. Have a good break. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks.
All right, everyone, welcome back from the break. It's been about five minutes. Hopefully you got some coffee or a bit of water and are ready to go back. So let's go ahead and bring Giuseppe back so he can uh, come here. Um, and also I wanted to say, I see, hi, welcome back. Hello. <laughs> I see that you have a question here from Daniele, if you wanted to answer that. Uh, yeah, um, I managed to scroll the chat and... <laughs> Okay, so the question uh, is, uh, what about performance of some models? Can I have a huge amount of data within a model layer uh, on top of it to let a view display items? Uh, yes, you can have a huge amount of data within a model. Uh, remember that the data is not inside the model, right? The model, the data is somewhere and you can have a big data structure somewhere uh, and the model is simply supposed to adapt that data structure for the purposes of a view. So yes, it can be as big as you need. Uh, and uh, of course, well, we're actually going to show this right now, but uh, views don't ask for the entirety of the contents of a model. Views are smarter than that. Uh, they typically just request what you can see on the screen at any given time. Uh, plus or minus a little buffer, but that's not important really. Uh, but by all means, they don't ask for the entire contents of the model to, to be fetched uh, just to show three lines. That would make no sense. And also another part of the same question, uh, what about single notification of let's say 1000 cells, uh, each of which can change every 30 milliseconds? Uh, that is also perfectly possible, yes. Um, there should be uh, no major concerns. Uh, of course, as I say that, uh, the, the rule of thumb is of course, uh, profile, profile, profile. Uh, don't, just, don't give anything for granted and don't assume that the bottleneck is somewhere without measuring it first. Uh, but that is not absolutely uh, a problem. You can have, uh, you can have uh, many, many notifications uh, per second, really uh, even more, many more than you're seeing right here right now. Uh, a thousand of notifications every 30 milliseconds, uh, that is perfectly doable. Um, uh, as I'm going to show in a second, actually, uh, you could do better than that in the sense that um, the notification that some cells have changed, uh, you can either emit them if you want atomically, one cell by one cell, but you could also uh, submit them in batches. The actual notification uh, takes a range. It does not take just the individual cell. So you may actually optimize that out and say, uh, this, one, this block of 1000 cells has changed, not uh, this cell and this cell and this cell and this cell emitting then 1000 different notifications. Um, I don't know if that answered the question, but please, uh, if you have further questions, let, let's keep them coming. Um, and I will continue now. If I manage to go back to the slides. Yep, here we go. Uh, by asking, uh, how about creating a list model? So it may sound simple, but this allows us to actually explore uh, all these different aspects of creating a model. How do we go about it? Okay, and what are the performance implications? What are the correctness implications? All these sort of small things that uh, we have to we have to think about when we design a model. Okay, so how do we go about it? How do we start creating a very simple model uh, that shows something on the screen? Uh, the simplest one that we can implement is something called uh, a list. So what we're going to do is very very simple. We're going to subclass Q abstract list model, okay? And the mandatory API to get a model done uh, is actually composed by these two methods. Only these two are pure virtual in Q abstract at the model. So the first one is something called the row count, which obviously as is a way to for the view to know how many rows are inside my model. And then the data function, one to actually fetch data uh, out of my model, okay? So that's pretty much uh, all we need to do. Now, if we also want to use this model in QML, 
uh, then we also may need to implement these uh, role names uh, function. Uh, but I'm going to show that uh, uh, later. I think I got a second slide for that. Uh, so let's look at let, let's look at that uh, after we make this one up and running. So I'm going to switch now to code share uh, to screen share. I'm sorry. Let's see if it works. Okay, I hope. Yes, yes, that's great. Okay, I'm hoping it's working, um, but I'm going back to my code. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going back to uh, that very code in which I had a list view. And suppose I want to create my custom model for it. So I'm not going to use this QString list model. I'm going to use my own list model. Okay, just to... Uh, to populate a list view. How do we go about it? So, okay, let's expand this and let's get started. As you can see, I'm starting literally from scratch. Okay, I'm not doing, uh, I'm not using any prepaid, uh, pre made uh, stuff because I want to really show you what is the typical workflow in creating a model. Uh, it's pretty much straightforward work, but still it deserves you know, some attention. So, as I said, uh, a model is an adapter. So we have to figure out what is our data that we are acting upon. Uh, let's see, let's say for the, for the purpose of the exercise that we start by uh, exposing the data contained into a uh, string list. Okay, so we have a string list is our data, okay? And we are simply going to expose it through a model. Okay, how does that work? So, so again, for, this, for the scope of the exercise, I'm going to put the, a list as a data member of the model. Uh, this may or may not be the case. Actually, typically, the data is not inside the model. The data is somewhere else, and the model just knows how to access it. Okay, but I'm, of course, I'm not actually doing that right here right now in the short time that we have. So let's start actually creating this. So I'm just going to give this guy a constructor. Okay, I hope this is straightforward code for all of you. This model parent. And I'm going to populate this list right in the constructor by using some list of strings coming with cute. One that I love to use are the color names uh, that are available from QColor. So this makes my list contain some data. That's fine. Uh, so the setup is done. Let's implement the QAbstract list model API. So what do I need to implement? As the slide said, there are two functions I need to implement. Uh, let me see if this actually works. Yeah. But there is a little bit of a hint inside Qt Creator. If you right click on your class definition, you go into refactor and uh, insert virtual functions of base classes. Yep, that's exactly what I want. And what do I want to add? It's already pre selected. It's the row count and the data, which are the uh, only pure virtuals that I must implement. I'm going to click OK. Voila. And they have been added down here row count and data. So this is convenient, so I don't get to type them and make uh, silly mistakes <laughs> in, uh, in front of a live audience. And these are the two, really. It's the row count, how many rows have I got, and the data. Fetch the data uh, for each index under a given row. Okay? So I don't like them down here. Let me just move them a little bit up. Right? And let's start implementing them. So we can discuss uh, what what's the deal with them. Okay. Uh, by the way, I'm sorry, but at the moment I don't see the chat because I'm sharing the screen. So uh, please again leave the questions. I will switch back to the chat in a second, and we can uh, and I can address any questions that you may have. So let's start by row count. How many rows does my model have? Well, I'm supposed to have one row for each element inside my list. So I could just return list.size. Yep, that would work. Uh, is this correct, though? 
am I ask am I answering it correctly? Because remember that even this this is a list. Look at the signature of row count. Row count takes a parent index. Because what I'm supposed to answer here is uh, is a broader question: is how many rows do you have below each possible index inside uh, your model? And all models are trees as far as Qt is concerned. So even though I have a list, it is legally uh, a, it is a valid question to ask my model. Okay. I understand that you have these many elements, let's say, below the root. But if I ask, how about below one of those elements in the list? Do you have, does it have children? Well, then the answer cannot be, no, I, it cannot be 42 or whatever this size is. It must be zero because I don't have children apart from directly below the root. So even something so simple like uh, returning a, row, a correct row count is actually a, contains a little bit of a trap if you want. You are not supposed to ignore the parent element. You are supposed to honor it by returning the correct information. Uh, so what I'm supposed to ask here is this. Is, uh, is, the, parent, is the parent that I'm being asked about the root of the list? Because even lists have a root. If this parent is the root, then I'm returning the size of my list, which sits just below the root. If the parent is not the root, so if this parent element is some element it's in my list, then I'm returning zero because my list elements don't have further children. And what is the query? How do I know if the parent is the root? Remember that the query is to ask if the parent is valid or if the parent is not valid, okay? So if the parent is not valid, then that's the answer. Otherwise, return zero, okay? This is the correct way to encode, to code row count, okay? So now, a view is asking me, okay, give me how many elements you've got. I've got 42 elements, perfect. Give me the data for element number three. So in order to give that answer, I need to implement this function. So uh, how do I know which index, I mean, I don't know something about the index that I'm passed in. Remember that an index remembers uh, its row, its column, its position in the model. So from the index, I can know which element of my data of the list I am referring it to. Yep, I can actually extract it right away by saying index.row. Uh, I don't really care about the column because I already have one column. I am a list, right? And then all I need to do is extract the list at that position. So I'm really using straightforward coding here. I'm going to call this like result or whatever, which is list at row. Yep. And then I return this result. If I build this, this builds eventually. No, it doesn't. Oh, I'm sorry. What what did I do? Ah, here we go with live coding. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, this kid creator being a bit too gallant and adding definitions out of class that I didn't need. Okay, that's fine. It's complaining that I'm ignoring the role. Well, yeah, that is something to, to keep an eye on. But uh, this is it, really. It's, it built. So this was the API that I needed to implement. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is to take this list model, uh, create an instance down here, line 58, OK? And uh, use it as a model inside my list view, OK? So I'm setting it as a model right here, and I'm showing the list view. I'm ignoring Qt Quick for the moment. So let's see what happens when I run this. Hmm. A nice empty list. What is going wrong here? What I'm doing wrong? Well, remember the warning, you are ignoring the role. Uh, yeah, I should not actually be ignoring the role. Uh, why is that? Uh, because the, the built-in delegate inside a queue list view asks for asks a different kind of data or in order to draw each line of my list view, okay? 
and it asks different things under different roles. And I am supposed to not ignore the role, but return the right thing depending on the role that I've been asked. So the delegate may ask, okay, what's the string that I need to represent, uh, that I need to, to use to draw your element? And string, so these are color names, it's the color blue. Okay, the string, I need to draw the string blue. And then he asks, okay, what kind of icon do you want? And by using a different role, so by using a decoration role. And my code is returning blue as a string. Okay, the delegates now are slightly confused. What kind of font should I use to draw your element? And I'm returning the font is called blue. You see where this is going? You know, by ignoring the role, I'm starting to return garbage to delegate, which gets super confused and eventually draws nothing on the screen. So I'm not supposed to do that. So I'm not supposed to ignore the role. Okay, I'm supposed to handle the role correctly. So what I want to do here is to handle at least one role correctly, the so-called display role. For the display role, I'm supposed to return a string, and I'm supposed that the string is the string visualized by the view. And I can then ignore any other role for the moment being uh, by returning an empty variant. And that means my model does not understand, does not handle that particular role. So what what this what code looks like here, I'm just going for the simplest approach. So if the role is not the display role, just return an empty covariant. Okay, I don't handle anything but the display row. Uh, more in general, you could think of this as a switch statement, right, on the different roles that you may want to handle. Uh, oops, yeah, thank you, compiler. Saved me from a silly mistake there. Okay, now it builds. And if I run it, okay, now we're up and running. Now I got my list of colors, okay, which is being fed from my model. Okay. So more in general, you may want this not to be uh, just an if, but you may want this to be a switch over the different kind of roles that you want to handle. And for each possibility, you return the right thing. So let's make this already a little bit more, if you want, fancy or complex. Let's also handle the uh, decoration role, which is the icon that should appear next to each uh, element in my list. Okay. So let's turn this into something better. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, yeah, I can do this, which is if you want common code. And then I put a switch on the role. Okay, so if it's, if it's the display role, then just to return salt. Okay, otherwise if it's the decoration role, then for the decoration, we can uh, return different things. We can return uh, an icon, we can return a color or something like that. Let's return a color. And since my string is a color name, I can actually just return. Uh, that's a Q color from the result. Okay. And uh, sorry. Okay. So I, so I just decide what to do depending on the role asked. This returns a string. This returns a color, uh, otherwise, return covariant. Okay, if I don't know the role, I don't know how to handle it. Sorry, uh, I, I cannot give you any data out of this. Run it, and now it looks even fancier. Look at that. Okay, now for each element, there is a little bit, a little square. That's what the queue list view default delegate gives to me, right? And it's able to handle uh, the two different roles that I'm returning, yep, by having a, a little color in there. Wow, okay, so that was relatively simple, wasn't it? Except for, you know, these little things that you must be, uh, that you must pay attention to. I'll switch quickly on the chat if there are any questions, but I don't see any. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> I, I, I knew about that. <laughs> oh, I, don't, I didn't know about that. The compiler knew about that, I'm happy about it. Okay, so back to the code. Uh, off we go, and let's let's see something else about this. Uh, 
So uh, let let me take these uh, working model and let me uh, also expose it to QML to make it uh, to make it possible to use this model uh, from the QML side. Now there is something peculiar about QML, which is this: uh, in QML, uh, when you write uh, a view and you write a delegate inside the view, uh, the delegate accesses the data in the model, but you don't specify roles as numbers or as enumerations because they don't kind of exist in QML. Well, they do, but they're different. In QML, you don't pass the roles as enumerations. Uh, in QML, you just use strings. You use, technically speaking, property names to figure out which role you want, OK? So if I open the QML code, yep. So this is my view in QML, OK? That's my list view. It's populated by the same model that I just created in C++. And if I look inside my delegate, uh, inside my delegate, I use these strings to fetch data out of the model, OK? So I use this property called display, or I use this property called index, or maybe some other property that I make acquired uh, property, uh, whatever, property string foobar. OK, so you come up with these names. And uh, how do these names reach the model? Uh, they don't reach the model directly because the model, the data function, does not get a property name as input. What happens is that there is a mapping between the property names that you use in QML and the integers that we use in C++ to represent the roles. Uh, this mapping is implemented. Uh, there is a default mapping in Qt, okay? But there is also a possibility to customize this mapping so that you can use any property name you want in QML, okay? You just synchronize with the designer. The designer tells you, I'm going to use these property names. And in C++, you define the mapping from the property names to uh, actual integers that we have in C++, okay? Uh, to give you an idea, so this is implemented in C++ by implementing the uh, another virtual, which is called role names. I'm going to use the same shortcut to avoid making mistakes, insert virtuals, and the one I want is called role names, this one. All right. Uh, sorry, moving it up again. Okay, here we go, here we go. So let's look at this function. What does this function do? This function returns a hash, so some sort of associative data structure, that maps integers, which are roles, to strings, which are uh, which are the property names used in QML. So if I want to map uh, the things that I was using QML to some of my integer data roles, I need to define this mapping. Okay, I need to create in here a qhash int qbyte array mapping and insert things as needed. So the mapping for Qt display role is called display. That, okay. That's the name of the property QML, and that's the role that my data function is going to get. And I keep populating it as needed. So mapping to whatever that is, it's called foobar, OK? And you keep populating it as needed. And then you return the mapping. OK, uh, by doing this, we, we are actually defining how the view in QML fetches data out of the model. OK, so we are defining pretty much what these things in QML uh, use to fetch the data out of the model. Uh, index is a special one. Index is built in. You don't need to provide it. It's going to be the index uh, of, the, of the number inside uh, the index of each delegate. So in, when, uh, when created by the view, so this is built in. But for display or for foobar or for any other kind of property that I do and uh, use in QML, I need to define this mapping. Now, luckily for me, there is a built-in mapping. So if I quickly open the role names 
documentation in Cube Abstract Data Model. Zoom in a little bit. Yep. As you can see, there is a default mapping predefined by Qt. Okay. So things like the display role is already mapped to the display name, decoration role to decoration, and so on and so, and so forth. Uh, but this may not be enough. You may need to extend this as needed. And you do that by overriding this function. Okay. And once you do that, once we override this role name, and now we build, actually, I, sorry, I enable Qt quick again. Did I do something wrong? I don't remember. Uh, OK, and I run it. Here we go. Now I got the model in C++, just as before, in a QList list view, and the same model in a list view in QML. OK? All right. Is there some, let me check if there are any questions coming up. Not yet. OK, I can keep. Sorry about this uh, hollow mirrors effect. It's what happens when you share the screen and also share the same window. OK, so uh, let's see a few, a few other things regarding this uh, model construction here. OK, um, there are a few other things that you may want to keep an eye on when you build such a model. So uh, get rid of this. So the first thing is this. Notice how I am getting the row here and then uses, using it to access the list. And I'm not doing any bounds checking. Right? I'm not even checking if this row is negative or if it's out of bounds or what not. I'm just trusting the index uh, to be correct. Is this right? Is this good? Is it bad? Uh, you may have different opinions regarding this. I'm just going to tell you that uh, the data function itself uh, does not expect the index to be out of bounds or anything like that. Okay? You are supposed to pass just valid indexes inside this function. You're not supposed to pass garbage. However, maybe you get a little bit of a paranoia mode, so you may want to actually double check or triple check that everything is fine, that no one is passing you whatever, the invalid index, right? The one pointing to the root of the model because that one does not have data. Or maybe someone made the mistake uh, of storing a model index for a period of time uh, then the model changed, and then it's, it's using it to access in your model. Or maybe there is even a, a simpler mistake. Maybe you get an index from model A, and you use it to access model B. Of course, that makes no sense, but technically, the code compiles. So how can you make sure that this index is correct? Uh, if you want to be really defensive, you have to start checking lots and lots of things. So you need to start checking, uh, get the row. OK, now, uh, if the row is less than 0, or the row is bigger or equals than uh, uh, the least sides, then it's not good. Right? Return Q variant. And I am sure that this index is in column as actually column 0. No, I need to check. So if index column is different from 0, then it's not good. Get out of here, right? And so forth, so forth. If the index uh, is not valid or whatever, well, this is kind of implied, but I don't want. And if the index model is different from this, this is, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, here we go. If the, uh, if the model of the index is not me, so, so this means that someone got an index from some other model and it's using it inside here. That's a problem. I don't want. I don't want to handle that. Okay. Right. So there, there are a couple of things here. Uh, the first is that remembering of doing all these checks is uh, is uh, well a lot. Okay. Uh, then you may not want to pay for these in production. Maybe you want to turn these into like assertions. So you check these in uh, debug mode, but ignore them in uh, release mode. OK. Uh, there are different philosophies that you, want, that you may want to use to tackle this problem. But uh, 
whatever is your philosophy, that is ignoring, debug only, soft assert, hard assert, uh, you name it, I'm sure that you don't want to write all these checks every single time you implement data uh, or any other model function, really, because when you start being paranoid, I mean, yeah, this is a set of valid checks for data. Uh, what about uh, row count? Should I check the same? Uh, probably you should check the same also in row count. Okay. So Qt offers you a little bit of help to avoid uh, doing all these checks on your own. Uh, the, there is a helper function that uh, I have personally added a little time ago in Qt, which is called check index. Okay. You can call checking check index, basic an index, plus some other uh, option. In this case, I want that uh, the index is valid. And this check index runs these checks for me. Okay, so it does some checks. I don't need to do them myself. And check index returns a Boolean. So I can then decide what is my strategy of dealing with the mistakes. Uh, you could leave it as an if. So if checking check index fails, uh, then I just return covariant, or maybe you print a warning message or whatever, really, or maybe you want this to be an assert, so you don't pay for this at runtime, uh, at, in production builds, you decide, okay? But this is the first, this is definitely the helper that you want to use uh, to be a little bit defensive in your programming, okay? To allow for some room for mistakes, that you can catch the mistakes before they become fatal. Right, so I can build with this. Uh, hopefully, it still builds, and you can run with this. Yep, and everything is fine. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Uh, okay. What else is there to say about uh, data? There is something else to say about data. Okay. Uh, let me show what what I mean by that. Uh, so this is my model. It's visualized inside this list view. There are like, I don't know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I don't know, 10 entries visible at any given time. So with 10 entries visible at any given time, okay, uh, how many calls to the data function on my model do you believe the view uh, issues? Is it 10 calls? Is it 20? Well, you know already that uh, each index is asked at least twice one for the decoration role and one for the display role. But how many? Well, let's find out. There's a very quick thing we can do, which is uh, just use a debug, print. Okay, I'm going to use something like a static int counter. And then I'm going to call number plus plus counter. For in for index index and row row. Yep, I'm just giving you a, a little bit uh, a little helper here, just a small static counter to understand how many calls are placed to a, a data function by a view. I don't know if anyone attempted an answer. Uh, in, the, in the chat. Okay, there is a question. We'll answer that question in a second. But so if you are thinking there are 10 visible elements, I'm going to have some like 100 or 200. Uh, where is the output? You were way off, way, way off. Let's look at the numbers down here. In Just by showing it a couple of times, <laughs> I've already given 1,000 or 2,000 calls. And takes nothing for these calls to rain to go up in the dozens of thousands. Yep. So uh, there is a little bit of truth here, which is this: uh, views don't cache anything. Uh, views will hammer your model to fetch every single piece of data they need. Okay. Uh, indeed, when you look at what this guy is doing, it's requesting. Just requesting some data from the model, really, it's not doing anything special. Okay, so it's requesting different roles for row seven, column zero of my list model. Row seven, column zero of my list model. 
Okay, and you can see the role is changing, so it's requesting different roles. It's only requesting a tiny subset of, row, uh, of rows because I can only see the first 10 or so. So it's only requesting data about those. But still, the view is asking a lot. Okay, it's asking everything it needs to the model. Uh, the view or the delegate does not actually cache anything. It's not their job. So your data function as a corollary needs to be fast, as fast as it can uh, to provide uh, data to the view. Please don't do something like uh, that every call inside data, you open a file on disk, you search for the data you need, and you close the file. Uh, or if you, if you have to issue some, like, whatever, request to some server, you do a request every time data is called. I've seen that done, and of course, the results are disastrous. You don't want to do that, all right? Uh, if there is any caching that needs to be done because your actual data layer is low, uh, the caching becomes responsibility of the model to do. You're not supposed to do it in the view or in the delegate uh, because it's not their job. It's the job of the model or some level below the model. Okay, this is just to give you an idea of, uh, of how data actually functions. Sorry, there was a question in chat, which was, is role names called every time or once and for all? It is uh, called once for all, okay? It's called, um, well, it's called once when you create the, when, uh, when you place a model into a view. Uh, and there is also a notification signal that you may emit, uh, which is called a model reset uh, to tell a view that uh, to forget about your model, to like restart from scratch, and that includes fetching again the role names, okay? Uh, but otherwise, once the mapping is done, once the view has fetched the mapping, uh, that's it. It's, uh, it's set in stone if you want. Uh, to be honest, I never had the need to change the mapping dynamically as I go. Typically, that doesn't happen. Once you have a view uh, and a delegate that expects certain roles, uh, those roles are already provided by the model and there isn't any need to change them as you go, but you never know. Maybe you have some use case for that. Okay, all right. And uh, let me actually add uh, something extra regarding this idea of building a robust solid model. There are another couple of things that you may want to do uh, once you have a model and maybe there is a mistake. Uh, maybe you don't see what you expected to see, okay? Uh, for instance, remember the first thing that we implemented. We ignored the role and just said the return result. Okay, that was a mistake. I was running this and uh, nothing at all appeared on my screen. Yep. So how do I, for instance, debug a situation like this? There are a couple of possibilities that you should be aware of. Uh, the first one, I cannot praise it enough, is of course using Gamma Ray on your, uh, on your application. If you launch Gamray, and if you want to know what this is, I gave a talk about Gamray a couple of years back at this very conference, so check out the video. Uh, and you attach Gamray on, on my application. Between the things that Gamray is able to show regarding your application, there is this little tab right there, which is called Models. You can click on it, yep, and uh, you can select the model, and this shows that the model is returning garbage. In particular, it shows you that you're returning a string for each role. So what is the string to show? It's uh, Alice Blue, okay? And what is the tooltip? Alice Blue, okay? And what is the font? Alice Blue, wait, what? And what is the size that should draw this unit in? It's Alice Blue. Okay, now I'm confused. I don't want to do that anymore. And that's the reason why we get uh, an empty screen. Okay, so this allows us to figure out what is actually going on. So the models tab allows us to, to inspect the content of models inside your application. Thank you. Okay, so please you have that as a little uh, uh, ace up your sleeve. There is also another thing that you may want to use, which is uh, a small helper class which is called QAbstract Item Model Tester. This helper class is something which is part of QTestLib and is something that you may want to keep around 
while you develop a model. Okay, uh, the point of this class is very, very simple. You just create one. Where is it here? And uh, you make it point to your model. Okay, so look at what I did. I just created a tester object. Tell, told it, okay, this is your model, and that's it. And the point of this tester object is to uh, stress test, if you want, to uh, check your model for uh, any kind of flaws that you may have when you develop your model, such as ignoring over here uh, the returning inconsistent row counts, something like that, returning the wrong data type for a given role, Okay, all these sorts of checks. It basically keeps uh, an eye on your model, and every time your model misbehaves, the tester will report something on your console, or if you want, it may also decide to crash your app. There are a couple of options that allow you to, uh, for instance, run your app into a debugger with this tester active, and uh, uh, if your model misbehaves, uh, the tester will make your app crash, but you are, you are in a debugger session, so you can backtrack and figure out why is my model reporting something inconsistent. So all you need to do really is to create an object, leave it around, and that's it. You don't need to, to do anything with it. It will report if something goes wrong. So thankfully, it's not reporting anything. Okay, my model is well behaved, but if I start doing something stupid, as I'm going to do in a second, then this tester will start to complain loudly. Okay. I don't know if I can quickly make it complain loudly by redoing the same mistake once more. Usually it doesn't, but uh, what is the deal with my computer? I think screen sharing is killing my CPU. Now, okay, it's still not kind of complaining about this. We'll see it in a second, however. So, uh, QAbstract Adam on the tester, keep it around while you develop. And then again, production, just remove this line or protect it by if defs, whatever you want to, uh, to uh, make it, uh, to not make it raise warnings in production. Any more, uh, any more questions? Um, where can you get the old talk on Gamma Okay, I will post the link uh, as soon as we over, uh, I guess. But it's, uh, if you look on YouTube and Google for Q today, my name, Gamma Ray, you will find it. And uh, does check index add overhead in production code? Can I select different options? So it adds the same overhead of doing the checks yourself. Uh, what it does is that it really runs the, the index through this series of checks, like uh, is it in range? Uh, is it, does it belong to myself or to some other model? So it is a little bit of overhead. Uh, whether that overhead is acceptable to you or not, Run into a profiler. Uh, it's I mean we're talking nanoseconds likely, okay, or microseconds. Uh, but if you have a model which is really a bottleneck, then you maybe you may not want to pay for those checks in the first place, because you're not supposed to pay for those checks, okay? Uh, the, the API of QAbstract data model is a strict API. It's a narrow API. You're not supposed to pass garbage in, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, Check index is mostly useful as a debugging helper or a debugging aid, in my view. But uh, you can definitely leave it in production code, and uh, it's unlikely you will see a massive performance hit unless you're really hammering your model uh, billions of times per second, something like that. And yes, you can select slightly different options, uh, depending on not all the checks make sense all the time. So uh, if you open the documentation, there is a little bit of discussion about what kind of checks you may request from check index. Uh, it's there, yes. Okay, I hope I answered the questions, all right. So I'm quickly going back to my presentation just to see that we have discussed this, we've discussed role names, and we've done a little bit of a demo about what we can do and how we create a model, how to make it robust, and how we debug the model in case something goes wrong, okay? Also this, 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 and this. Now, um, let's also do something else. That is, let's make our model modifiable somehow. Okay, I may want to decide that my model is not read-only as it is at the moment, but I may want to let the views or the delegate 
edit the data in my model. How do I do that? So to do that, there is something very simple that I need to do. I need to implement additionally two extra functions. Okay. These two extra functions are called flags and set data. And these are the ways that uh, the, a view is going to modify the data inside my model. Uh, there is also something that must be said here. That is, uh, this is the API that, which is, if you want, the API that the views talk. But nobody uh, stops you from providing your own model-specific ways to set data. Right? If it makes sense for the rest of the application, for the rest of the business logic that you have, to also have some other way to change data inside your model, by all means, add the extra functions. The only caveat is that the built-in views and delegates don't know about it. You need to uh, either use a custom delegate or do something else to uh, make them use your model-specific way. The only way that the built-in views and delegates know about are these two functions right here. Okay. And now, once you modify something, you also need to tell the view to refresh itself or to tell other views uh, I'm using one model and two views. You may decide to have one view modify the model and the other view has to change. So how do we go about that? We need to emit a signal. We need to emit a notification signal. This notification signal is called data changed to notify the views. So let's do that. Let me share the screen again. And let's see how do we create a modifiable, oh, what did I do? Okay, a modifiable uh, model. So everything stays the same, but I need to implement something extra now. The first thing I need to implement, sorry, I'm going to use the shortcut again so I don't do any mistake, is to implement uh, this function called flags, yep, and also set data, this tree. OK, there we go. I don't know why Creator has this tendency of adding stuff to the bottom. I'm going to put it over here so they stay close to everyone else, and we can start. We can start. Okay, let's start from the second one. Flags. Uh, what is this about? Uh, for each index of a model, you can provide an additional set of flags that describe what a view can do with that particular index. So these flags are things like uh, the item can be selected or the item should appear uh, enabled or disabled, or the item can be modified. You know, the usual drill, if you want. Okay, so you, you can provide, uh, this is, if you want, a bitmask of, uh, of flags, and by default, elements are not modifiable. By default, elements are selectable, I believe, and enabled. But you can decide, uh, index by index, what you want to do. So you may want to allow some elements to be enabled, some elements to be disabled, some elements not to be selectable, anything you want, really. OK. So I need to pretty much, what we need to do here is to add the, the possibility of uh, modification to my elements. So what I'm going to do here, very lazily, I'm going to uh, return the same flags that QAbstract list model. Where is it? Here. Flags. Things are true for a given uh, for a given index, and I'm going to or cute cute item is editable. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to be very very quick, very very lazy, but simply going to bitwise or the possibility of elements to be edited through uh, a view. Okay. Once a view sees this, uh, they may decide they may allow editing to happen on a particular index. Okay. I'm just returning it for all the indices. I don't care. And how does the editing actually happen? The editing happens uh, by calling the set data function. So the views the delegates are going to call set data to set a new value, this value here, on a given index, this index here. And again, you may decide to edit one specific role of your view. Uh, the default role that gets edited by something like a queue, uh, this view is called the edit role. But that's up to you. Uh, you may decide to have a custom delegate that decides to edit another role, whatever. Now, the set data, what, the, what is its responsibility? Is to go to the actual data, do the editing. 
Now, the editing may fail or may succeed. If it fails, you just search on false, and the view knows that the editing failed. If the editing succeeds, you return true. But if the editing succeeds, you are also responsible to emit the notification signal telling other views, telling everyone, hey, my data has changed. Okay. So the way we do that is uh, it's pretty simple. I'm going once more to just extract the sorry row. OK, uh, just for, for a practical reason, I'm going to do any checks whatsoever here, but you may want to add the checks. OK, so what I need to do here is to modify the list at position row and set it value as a string. Uh, and now I'm going to accept the notification. So return true. But before I do that, I need to notify everyone that this specific row has changed. And I do that by emitting the data changed signal. OK, now this is the signal that notifies something has changed inside the model update okay and this signal actually has two parameters or three parameters should i say uh, these parameters pretty much describe the region of my model that has changed okay uh, you can pass uh, a range of indexes that has changed not just one index now in my case uh, just the one index has changed so i'm just going to pass index index so I got a range of size one, it's, uh, it's the index. Uh, but in principle, this could be a range of indexes that has changed altogether, OK? So if I didn't do any mistakes, uh, I can build this now. Oops, yeah, sorry, again, the role. Uh, yes, you're supposed to check if the role is correct. So if the role is not the edit, the cute edit role, that just certain false because I don't know to edit anything but the edit role. And if I manage to build this, and we can go. OK, so this is my list, just like before. And now I should be able to double click on element. And here we go. I'm able to edit it and set to hello. And now it says hello. Or I change it to something else like blue and changes. Hello, cute day. That's pretty neat. And to double check that this actually is working as intended, well, uh, let me bring back the cute quick uh, UI. Uh, please build quickly. OK, here we go. So now I've got both two views on the same model. I can go here, change this to hello. And notice that it changed also in the other model. Yep, it's, the two models are kept, are, well, are the same model. They're not two models. The two views are using the same model. And once I modify one model, the, the model through this view, I'm emitting the right notification signals. So the other view picks them up and updates the data at those positions. OK. So I think it's fine. And this is how, this is how uh, you're supposed to do it. So uh, what is this edit role? Uh, this edit role is simply uh, uh, the role that gets normally used for modifications uh, because maybe you want to make your data uh, appear on the screen in a certain way. And then when the user requests editing, you may want to make it appear in a different way. OK, maybe you have, I don't know, uh, you're showcasing some numbers. And when you're showing them, you want to use all the fancy uh, decimal separator and uh, multiple of thousand separators and whatnot. But then when the user wants to edit it, you just want to show the number without any fancy string decoration. So you may return two different things. You may handle the display role as a fancy formatted string and the edit role as a number. And that's why you have these two different roles when it comes to uh, data and set data. Even in a data, yeah, we can also actually return the in data we can return the same string as the edit role so that when i start editing the editor already contains uh the, the string that i want to edit as that string 
So when I start editing this one, as you can see, it's proposing me to edit the string antique white. I change that to blue. Okay. So this is how we implement editing. Let me see if there are any questions. Uh, can I use the reset model to notify that all the data has changed? Um, in principle, yes, uh, but uh, there is something different between changing the data and resetting the model. Uh, there are two semantically different operations. So if you change the data, that means the structure of the model is the same, okay? Uh, the data has changed inside the model. If you use the reset model, you're telling me that uh, everything about the model has changed. So you may have changed also the number of rows, the number of columns, uh, everything has to be fetched again. Uh, a view will likely lose its scrolling position if you reset the model, because it's like if you are setting a brand new model for the view. So use that as a last resort to really mean uh, the model has been resetted. Don't use it as a shortcut instead of emitting the right notification signal because this will backfire. Okay. And uh, okay, let me, let me go back here. So this is how we handle modification of the data. And I got one last thing, uh, which is how do we handle modification of the structure? Well, sometimes I'm not modifying the data as is. I'm not modifying, I'm not uh, um, uh, changing the contents of the model. I'm just changing the model structure itself. Maybe I'm adding rows, I'm removing rows, adding columns, removing columns, whatever. Okay. So this kind of changes, um, this kind of changes must also be notified to the views. Okay. And how these changes happen? Okay, they can happen through the public API. They can happen through your own model specific ways. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that you notify the consumers, the views, that your model has changed. What is tricky about structural modifications is this, is that uh, cute, view, cute models have an, a notification approach, which is uh, transactional. What do I mean by that? I mean this, suppose that you have your model and you want to tell the views that uh, you have inserted the new rows, okay? How do you do that? Well, you do it like this. You call begin insert rows to tell the views, I am about to insert the rows. I have not inserted anything yet, okay? I'm about to. Then you actually insert the rows, okay? And once you're done, you call end insert rows. You don't emit any signal on your own. Uh, Qt will emit the, the right signals for you in the right order with the right parameters. But you must pretty much wrap every critical section in which you modify the structure of your model by these begin and pairs of functions. And of course, this is for inserting rows the same identical story for uh, columns and the removal and resetting of models, okay? They're all transactional. So how do we do that? Suppose that I want my model to have new rows uh, at the beginning, okay? So I want to, to add a, a couple of new rows to inside my model. And I want, of course, my, uh, my uh, views to be notified about that. So for that, I'm just going to add a custom method of mine. I'm going to call it add rows, whatever. Okay, and what I'm going to do here is this. So suppose I want to add one row at the beginning of the model. Before I do anything at all, I call, I begin the transaction if you want. Okay, so I call begin insert rows. And begin insert rows wants to know where you're adding the rows. So it wants to know the parent index. In my case, I'm running them uh, just below the root. So it's key model index. Uh, where you're adding them, that's the second parameter, and how many. Okay, so I'm adding them below index number zero. Okay, and the third parameter is not actually how many, it's not a count, it's uh, what is the last number in the range that you want to add. Uh, to better understand these two parameters, I definitely recommend to open documentation of begin insert rows, which is, oops, right here. Yeah. 
And there's this very nice uh, picture that shows you what these parameters mean. So suppose that you have this list that right, goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you want to add these three elements in the middle, right? You're supposed to say that uh, you're inserting before the old position two, and the last one you're going to add is going to be at position four. So this is the meaning of these parameters, okay? If you add at the end, you're going to add before position four, and the last one is going to be position five. And that's why you, add, you call begin set rows four or five. Uh, don't worry too much about this because I still get this one wrong. Uh, refer to the documentation every time you manipulate this or write, draw a small diagram and understand what is the numbering. It's a little bit tricky, but as anything that expresses ranges, the opportunity of a off by one is always there. So yeah, I'm going to just insert something at the very beginning. Okay. Uh, and before doing this, I don't touch anything. Then I'm actually going to insert uh, something in my list. I'm going to insert something at position zero, hello today, and then I'm going to call and insert rows. Okay. Uh, Giuseppe, so sorry to interrupt. No. I don't think you are sharing your screen. Oh, I'm, oh, like I'm so see. sorry. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is what happens when I have to switch back and forth. No problem. Thank you. I'm so terribly sorry. Uh, sorry, everyone. Uh, thank you for noticing or not noticing. Okay, uh, here we go again. Okay, so what I want to show is this. Quick recap. I went into my model and I, I, I used this void add rows uh, function as a custom function to insert rows into my model. Okay, as we were discussing, add rows, sorry, yeah, rows insertion or removal or any that kind of structural modifications are uh, transactional. You're supposed to call begin and end, okay? And wrap your modifications between these two, right? Now, begin insert rows describes, says, I want to add the rows and you need to tell uh, where you want to add and how many. So I want to add the rows below the root starting from index zero and ending at the index, index zero. This means I'm adding one row just below the root, just after the root. Then I'm actually doing that. I'm modifying my data storage, okay? And then I'm saying, okay, I'm done. Yep, and this is all I need to do to implement some sort of modification of my model. So what I can do now is, for instance, uh, have a timer trigger and uh, add this other row to my model. Uh, timer start uh, like one second and connect my timer. Keep timer time out to my list model. Uh, that row. Okay, does that work? Oh, what did I do now? Let's go. Add rows. Yeah, no, so add rows. Just one that I'm adding. Okay, and eventually this builds. Why is it so slow today? Okay. And as you can see, uh, the model is being modified by a mysterious god, which is keep his, keeps inserting rows at the beginning. Yep, but it's actually working, right? So as you can see, a new row is getting added at the beginning every second. Uh, let me actually show that these rows are all different. So, uh, error, country zero, and this is string, lock your day, number. Uh, eventually this builds, and we're good to go, okay. As you may notice, this model is being modified structurally. I'm adding new rows into the model at any position I want. Okay. Yep. As you can see, the views are scrolling automatically to keep uh, to keep dealing with uh, uh, the fact that my model is uh, is adding more data. Okay. Everything is good, right? Yep. 
Sounds good. Okay. So let me see if there are any questions. Sorry about uh, the, the little uh, hiccup in terms of going back and forth or sharing code, sharing screen. Are there any questions so far? Okay, it does not look like it. Um, okay, because otherwise I think I'm done, pretty much right on time. Uh, I have some bonus slides that, I'm, of course, I'm going to leave to the attendees. Uh, how do we extend this? So how do we go like to tables or to something, uh, to trees? Uh, now you should know enough to go there. Okay, a table handle also the columns. That's the idea. Okay, we handled the rows so far because it was a list a table we also handle columns okay uh the so uh that's pretty much it uh trees are slightly more complex for trees you may require a little bit of uh understanding but you should have all the things you need now to handle trees as well and you can build on top of this there are more complicated structures like uh, proxy models and other fancy stuff coming from Qt. Uh, from KD toolbox, from Kai, K item models. By all means, use all of those if you want to uh, build complicated models or complicated model stacks. Uh, this is uh, okay, this is the bread and butter of model making. So, I think yeah, right on time. It's ten past the, the hour. Uh, are there any questions? Let me scroll up a little bit in the chat. Let me see if I have got uh, something missing here. Okay, it's a comment, I think. The part that is not really well documented is the handling of the layout changes and how to properly handle the persistent model index. Uh, that is absolutely right. Um, it, that is probably the most advanced topic coming from uh, to, to discuss in terms of uh, model view. Um, I don't have the time to go through that kind of functionality right now, uh, but uh, what I would suggest you to do is that if you get to that point, I would suggest you to read the source code of some class that implements layout changes. And to understand, there's usually a fair amount of comments left by the authors uh, that had to go through the trouble of understanding the semantics of that. And so they left the comments in the code saying, I'm implementing layout changes, and these are the semantics that I expect, OK? Uh, so yeah, it's it's really a, a tremendously advanced topic. It's probably one of the most advanced topics that you may handle when you're dealing with models. Uh, don't worry too much. That that's definitely not something you do every single day. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Is there something else? Some other question? Uh, you are very welcome. I would like to uh, take this moment, this opportunity to uh, thank. The Q today organizers once more for uh, having us every year. Uh, of course, the virtual conference is not as the same as uh, being in Florence in spring, drinking wine during the lunch breaks. Um, maybe that's something for next year, crossing fingers. Uh, but anyhow, thank you very, very much to all the organizers. Uh, I won't do any names because I will forget somebody. So uh, thank to Develer for organizing this. Absolutely. And thank you for your contribution as well. Uh, let's cross our fingers that next year we could do it in person. <laughs> yep, definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, if that's it, if we have all the questions, then we can uh, take take a, a bit before the next workshop that we have at 2.30. Right. Um, I'm available. So uh, if you Google my name, you will also find my email address. Uh, send questions this way offline, uh, by all means do that when you watch this talk uh, even later on on YouTube. Uh, please don't leave comments on YouTube and then nobody watches them and replies to them. Write to me. I, I can reply. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Oh, and I just want to remind all of the participants that if you enjoyed the workshop, you can actually rate it on the agenda page of Vizabo. So uh, we always yeah. appreciate feedback. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> please. Uh, thank you. Oh, yeah. And everyone's asking for the slides as well. Um, I'm sure. Uh, I don't. I mean, I, I will give the, the organizers. I'm not sure, exactly sure how they will get sh shared to everybody. Uh, probably on Bizabo, I guess. I think we can arrange something. Yeah, we will leave a link somewhere. We'll so find that, some way to yeah. do it. Definitely. <laughs>
All right. Well, uh, I'll leave you to it. I hope you enjoy the rest of your your day, Giuseppe. And thanks uh, also to all the participants as well. Thank you very, very much. All right. We'll see you next time. See you next time. <laughs> Bye-bye. Definitely. Bye-bye. All right, everyone, that concludes this workshop. Uh, we'll be back here at 2.30 p.m. Italian time, which is in about an hour and uh, 15 minutes for our next workshop, which is Create User Interfaces with Qt on Raspberry Pi with Luca Ottaviano. So hope to see you then. Thank you. Bye-bye.